Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. It always helps me while I'm up here, but it also helps get everybody into, you know, a state of mind. All right, Father God, we just thank you so much for allowing us to be here today. Lord, we thank you for safe travels through the rain, and we thank you for the rain. Um, Lord, we definitely need it around here, and uh, you've brought it in abundance. And uh, Lord, I thank you today as we read your word, as we learn from it. You know, we know that your word does not return void, and that every message, every scripture is life-changing. And Father, we just thank you that we will not leave here the same. We'll be changed by your word and the life that it brings. In Jesus' name, amen. So pastor has been doing the study on the you know, chronological teachings of Paul, uh, which has been fantastic. I've been blessed by it, and I know you all have. Um, but I'm going to kind of switch gears a little bit, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the Old Testament. It's amazing to me that um, you know, a lot in the church today don't hold the Old Testament in regard like it should be. Um, they see it as kind of more of a nuisance than a, than a blessing. Um, but we know that, you know, it's, it's scripture. It's the word of God. It's, it's something that never changes. And even though the rituals and the, you know, the old book of the law and everything aren't necessarily for us, we can always learn from it by example. Um, all throughout the New Testament, you know, all through the book of Acts, we see Peter, Stephen, Paul, all using the Old Testament when they're going around evangelizing. You know, we see, um, you know, when Stephen is giving his, huge discourse to the uh, to the Pharisees you know he goes through the entire pretty much history of Israel in a chapter or two and every bit of it's from the Old Testament and he uses it to prove that Jesus was the Christ and even you know Jesus used it more than yeah. you know um, but the thing is was that we need the Old Testament we need what it has we need the examples it shows and one of my favorite um, you know, it's just one chapter out of the Old Testament, but to me it speaks a lot. Um, it's over in 2 Samuel, in chapter 9. But before we go there, um, you know, the, to get an understanding of what's going on in this chapter, we kind of have to backtrack a little bit, get a little bit of context. Um, at the end of 1 Samuel, uh, we see that Saul, Jonathan, and his sons have all died uh, by the hands of the enemy. Um, and so Israel is essentially left without a king. Um, but we know from before that that God had already anointed David to be the king. And so we see here um, through the first eight chapters of 2 Samuel is um, David bringing the kingdom back together under his rule. Um, he didn't start out as ruler of all of Israel. Um, he was only crowned the king of Judah to begin with, and he had to fight you know, small wars in between. And then finally, after, I believe it said seven, seven and a half years, um, he became king of Israel and Judah. And so David was in the place that God told him he was going to be many decades before. And so throughout all this, you know, the... In the, in, the, in the real world, I guess you want to call it, or the, or the natural, you know, if there's a king, the, the person who's going to take his place is most likely going to be his son. Um, there's no, you know, somebody just can't come out of the woodworks and say, I'm going to be king. And so that's the natural order of things, is that the lineage of the king goes to rule and everything. Well, you know, what the world does and what God says are two completely different things. And so God said David's going to be the king. And so it took some time for it to happen, but when it did happen, it was God's will. And uh, we're going to start in 2 Samuel chapter 9, uh, verse 1. It said, Now David said, Is there still anyone who is left of the house of Saul that I might show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now we understand, we know here that back in 1 Samuel, as you know, uh, David was serving under Saul, that him and Saul's son Jonathan became 
great friends. I mean, friends is not even enough to say they were brothers. Um, they made covenant with each other, and we know how binding a covenant is, a blood covenant. It's not just, hey, we're friends, and we're going to look out for each other. It's, it runs so much deeper than that. It's really a spiritual thing. And whenever you make a covenant with somebody, it's not just between you two. It's between the families that come together with it. And so David, after all this time, he's been trying to you know, get his kingdom together and, and, and be where God has told him to be. He's finally had some time to relax. He's kind of sitting there and he's just saying, you know, is there anybody left that I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? Because Jonathan, he had the covenant with Jonathan. And so he says, since I have the covenant with Jonathan, I have the covenant with his family. And so there's somebody there. If there's anybody there, I want to show them kindness. I want to do right by Jonathan for them. So we go to verse 2 in chapter 9. He says, And there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba. So when they had called him to David, the king said to him, Are you Ziba? And he said, At your service. Then the king said, Is there not still someone in the house of Saul to whom I may show the kindness of God? And Ziba said to the king, There is a son of Jonathan who's lame in his feet. And so this king says to him, where is he? And Ziba said to the king, indeed, he is in the house of Maker, the son of Amamuel in Lodabar. Now, the person he's talking about is Saul's grandson. Um, king Saul's grandson, Jonathan's son, his name was Mephibosheth. Now, for the sake of me not messing that name up, I'm going to call him Seth from here on out. <laughs> But know that he, it is Mephibosheth that I'm talking about. So the thing about Mephibosheth, is, Seth, is um, if you go back to chapter 4 of 2 Samuel, and you look at verse 4, it says, Jonathan, Saul's son, who had a son who was lame in his feet, he was five years old when the news about Saul and Jonathan came from Jezreel, and his nurse took him up and fled. And it happened, as she made haste to flee, that he fell and became lame. His name was Mephibosheth. And so what happened here is during all this time when, when David is, is getting his kingdom together and everything, uh, Seth's nurse, who you know, took care of him from his birth, got scared. Because when somebody else is not in the family, is trying to take power, they usually kill everybody who's in the lineage of the past king. And so she was scared that, he, that David was going to come after Seth. And she did not want that because she loved him. I mean, she took care of him from the time, you know, he was young. And so she wanted to look out for him. And so she took him and fled the city. But in and, and, and the haste of everything, she actually dropped him. And he fell awkward on his feet or, you know, whatever. And he became lame. <laughs> now, the extent of how lame he was, we don't know. Um, it could mean... Just that, you know, ankle broke, you know, legs broke, and it didn't set right, and he couldn't walk well, or that he was just completely not able to walk. We, we, we don't know, but we know that he was lame, and he wasn't whole the way he was supposed to be. And so, so we see that um, uh, Seth is now in a place called Lodabar. And if you look in the Hebrew, the word Lodabar actually means um, pastureless or a dry place. So... Seth was literally in, in a place that was very dry. And um, yeah. so has anybody ever been to a desert? Like traveled out west? Anywhere? I mean, it's <laughs> a desert is obviously a dry place. I mean, you go out there, and the minute you step out of your car, like all the moisture just gets sucked out of your, I mean, it's just, it's, you become so dry, and that, I mean, it's just like, oh, it's so weird. You, you try to apply lotion, but that just gets, you know, sucked right out of you again. And so it's, it's, it's not a fun place to be. You know, you go, um, whenever I was at Rama during my second year, we went to uh, the Navajo Indian Reservation on a mission trip during spring break. And that's when I first saw the desert. I'd never seen the desert before there. And, you know, you, you, you come back after being out there all day, and it's just nasty. You know, you come, you take a shower, and it's just like, oh. Where did all this come, you know, sand is just, you know, everywhere. And, um, and so we see, you know, Seth is in this place that's called the dry place. Now, in South America, there's a, a desert called the Atacama Desert. It is the driest place on earth. 
Um, scientists have done studies, whatever, everything. Um, it's not the largest desert, but it is the driest. Um, and how dry is it, you ask? Well, <laughs> the average yearly rainfall is less than one millimeter. I mean, we're talking like, I mean, that's not a lot. <laughs> and so you have um, you know, less than one millimeter rain. There's some weather stations in the desert who have never reported rain, ever, ever seen a drop of rain. Um, you see some of the river basins there have been dry for uh, millennium, like hundreds of thousands of years. Never ever seen a drop of you know, water. Um, and there's actually evidence that suggests that the region may not have had any rainfall from the year 1570 to 1971. And there's a lot of things that you know, can cause places like this. When I was in the Navy, um, I, was, I was a weatherman. Um, I did um, forecasting, observing, that sort of thing. And so when I look at this, I think, well, that's pretty cool. <laughs> you know, and like, well, why is it, you know, why is this the driest place ever? And it's, you know, there's, there's the way it's situated, it's on the west side of South America. You've got the Pacific Ocean here, the desert, and then the Andes Mountains. And in the southern hemisphere, your prevailing winds, you know, here all of our storms move from west to east, you know, unless it's local, it might, you know, do some crazy stuff. But for the most part, your frontal systems all move west to east. But in the southern hemisphere, they move east to west due to the, you know, Coriolis effect and all that junk. But with the mountains being where they are, the, um, the winds come up the mountain and it sucks all the moisture as it goes up into the air from the mountains. And by the time it gets over to the side of where the desert is, there's nothing left. And so that's why it's so dry. But, um, and so we see Mephibosheth in this place. And, you know, spiritually, we've all been in dry places before. Um, before we knew Christ, we were in the driest place ever. We were like, we were in the Atacama Desert. There was nothing, there was no life in us, there was nothing um, going on. There was nothing going for us at all. And I can just see Mephibosheth here in this place. And at this time, he's, he's got to be in his late teens, probably early 20s. So he's been here since he was five years old, um, told he has to stay here, or else if he leaves, he's going to die. You know, if David's men get wind of him, you know, they're going to come back and they're going to kill him because he's the heir. And so I can imagine, like, the bitterness and just the, you know, hatred and just, just bad place that he would be in thinking about all this day in and day out. And, you know, of course, he's lame in his feet, and so he may not be able to even go outside at all, like physically able to. And so, I mean, he's just, I can just see that being a miserable place. And, and like I said, and then for somebody, you know, who's never known Christ, that's a very, you know, real place um, where, you're, where you feel like you're trapped in a place, and if you leave and if you try to seek out God, that he's just going to strike you down because he's mad at everything you've ever done. And we have people, you know, people, we have the enemy, we have all these false, um, really, thoughts towards God sometimes um, from outside of people who really know God. Um, and they'll tell them that, you know, like, hey, you can't go to God because he's going to strike you down and everything. And so people get to that place, and they don't know what, you know, true love is. They don't know that God's really not after them. And so let's continue on in Seth's story. In verse 5 of chapter 9, 2 Samuel, he said, Then King David sent and brought him out, sent and brought him out of the house of Machir, the son of Emil from Lodabar. Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, had come to David, he fell on his face and prostrated himself. And then David said, Mephibosheth? And he answered, Here is your servant. So David said to him, Do not fear, for I will surely show you kindness for Jonathan, your father's sake. And I will restore to you all the land of Saul, your grandfather, and you shall eat bread at my table continually. And so uh, he bowed himself and he said, What is your servant that you should look upon such a dead dog as I? And so now go back to looking at him in the desert. Go back and look at him in that dry place. He's sitting at home one day. And all of a sudden, all these chariots and all these horses and men, you know, they start, I mean, they're like surrounding your house, and you're sitting there like, this is it. I'm, I'm done. There's, my life is over. And then you get that, get out of here. 
get out of here, we got to go. And, he, you know, I, I can just see how scared he would be. You know, so, but, but the thing about it is, is that, uh, to, to his credit, as, as probably as upset as he was and as um, maybe, I don't know, bitter towards David as he was, when he got to in front of David, you know, he humbly brought himself down and said, Lord, what is it that you, you know, he called him, he respected who he was, even though he might have been facing his own death. And so, you know, David here says, no, don't fear. I'm not, you know, I'm not here to kill you. I'm here to show you kindness because of my covenant with your father. And so then we see that all the lands of Saul, <clears throat> everything that Saul owned as king would be restored back to uh, Seth here. And he would have servants to tend the land and everything. So he would reap the benefits while also eating at the king's table every day. Now, even in the shoddiest kingdoms of earth, if you're eating at the king's table, it's not ramen noodles and bologna sandwiches. You know, it's, you're eating the, the, the good stuff, the prime rib, the, you know, the, the lamb chops or whatever it is. That's what you're going to eat. You're going to eat whatever's the best thing of the land. And so Mephibosheth went from this crazy dry place to where he had nothing, he was alone. Yeah. All of a sudden, he's been elevated, and he's like, well, now what do I do, <laughs> you know? And so we'll, we'll continue on here. Uh, verse 9, he said, And the king called to Ziba, Saul's servant, and said to him, I have, given to you, I have given to your master's son all that belonged to Saul and to all his house. You therefore and your sons and your servants shall work the land for him, and you shall bring in the harvest, but your master... So your master's son will have food to eat, but Stan, or Seth, your master's son, shall eat bread at my table always. And then Ziba said to the king, according to all that the Lord has commanded me, his servant, so will your servant do. As for Seth, said the king, he sh shall eat at, my uh, eat at my table like one of the king's sons. And said, Seth had a young son whose name was Micah, and all who dwelt in the house of Ziba were servants to Seth. So Seth dwelt in Jerusalem, for he ate continually at the king's table, and he was lame in both of his feet. And so, you know, just like David remembered his covenant with Jonathan, and he found out that there was somebody in Jonathan's house, he sent people out to find him and bring him back. Well, it's just the same thing that Christ does for us. You know, he sends people along our path our entire life to show us the love of Christ and to show us, to bring us bring us to the king's table. You know, it's no accident the people you run into. It's people that God put in your path. And so, in that same way, when we do accept it, we also get to eat at the king's table. You know, but at his table, it's not just, you know, it's not just bread, not just water, not just food. It's everything we could ever need. It's provision, whether it's financial, whether it's... Um, you know, spiritual, whatever we need from God, it's there. It's, it's health, it's healing. It's, it's just a matter of whether or not you are going to take it, you know, whether you're going to receive it or not. You know, I, I think about whenever I first moved out here, uh, I was eating over at Pastor's house, you know, quite a bit because I didn't have any money, I had no job. And so <clears throat> I get to Pastor's house the first time. I actually, I remember it vividly. <laughs> you know, I pull up my seat, I sit down at the table, <laughs> Everybody's going to town, you know, getting all their stuff. And I'm just kind of sitting there like, I'm just going to wait, you know. And so finally they're like, here, get oh, So, you know, I hand, I'm just, you know, do you want more? No, I'm, I'm, I'm good, you know, I'm fine. Because you don't know exactly what you're allowed to do, you know. And so I can just see, like, Seth doing the same thing. Kind of maybe a little timid at first, you know. And, but then he realizes there's all this food, and he can just be like, hey, I want that. I want that. I want that. And so he gets whatever he wants. And then that's just kind of the same thing that happened with me, you know. It's now it's like I'm part of the family. I can just dig right in over at the house. And it's, it's great because Miss Jenny can cook really well. <laughs> so, but, you know, the concept here is that, you know, the same thing is, is, is the same thing with us in Christ. As we're sitting at the king's table, you know, if you're sitting at the table of Jesus of God, he has laid out all these things for us. He's laid out everything, like I said, that we'd ever need, everything we could ever want. Obviously, there are certain rules to follow, um, but everything depends on whether or not we're going to take it, whether or not we will receive it yeah. as much as God wants to dish it out. And, you know, to get to that place, obviously, it takes knowing God. 
It takes, you know, because we were, you know, like I said, out there like Seth was. We had no vision of God. We, had, we didn't know who he was. We thought he was this person that was just going to, you know, mean-spirited and strike me down whenever I did something wrong. But then we realized that, you know, with his covenant with Jesus, you know, with the covenant he had with Jesus and, you know, that he, you know, bore every one of our sins and that we're no longer, you know, held in, um, you know, the wrath of God is not towards us in that, in that way anymore. You know, it just takes us realizing that. And uh, a good example of this, you know, Pastor Hagen was always talking about, um, you know, whenever he's in his office, you know, studying for a sermon or whatever, his kids could just run up to the office, pop down in his lap and start talking to him, whatever he wanted to do and everything. But not everybody, you know, could do that. But when we get, you know, the vision of, of God as our Father, that we can approach the throne. We can, um, anytime we need anything, we can just run up to his office, if you will, pop on his lap and say, Dad, this is, <laughs> you know, this is what I need and everything. And um, so, and then, uh, you know, another thing that kind of caught my, always catches my attention in this is that, you know, it's said over and over again that Seth is lame in both of his feet. You know, it's, it's, it's no doubt he was broken. Um, you know, his, his life was essentially stolen away from him at such an early age. But, you know, at the king's table, too, is... <coughs> sorry. Um, it's not just um, the king and his family eating with him all the time. I mean, there's, there's anybody who visits from, a, you know, neighboring country, you know, some, you know, wants to make peace or wants to, you know, make a deal or something, they're going to be eating at the table with... David with everything. And so Mephibosheth, you know, he's sitting there at this table, and, you know, I can just see this long table with, you know, the long tablecloth and everything. And when he's sitting at that table and those dignitaries come in, they don't know that he's lame in his feet. They, they, they don't see that aspect of it because he's not up, you know. And so, you know, and I think about if y'all were at the, the wedding, you met my brother, he was in a wheelchair. And I remember one time we were at a restaurant, and um, we had you know, wheeled him in, got him into his chair, and the, you know, waitress took his wheelchair somewhere else so it wouldn't be in the way. And I went to the restroom, I came back, and I saw my brother at the table, and I thought to myself, wow, he's at least, like, there's nothing wrong with him. He looks so normal, you know? And it's, it's, it's really an amazing thing when it was just, it caught me off guard. And um, it kind of clicked in my head. I was like, man, that's what, that's what Seth looked like at the table. Nobody ever knew, you know, what happened to him. And that's the same thing with us spiritually. As we're sitting at the king's table, we are in Christ. You know, the principalities, the devil, everybody, prowers in the air. They don't know that we were that fallen person. They don't know how, you know, that we're weak because we're not weak. We're strong in Christ. All they see is a king's son. All they see is Christ. And so we don't have to fear. We don't have to, you know, there's, there's nothing out there that can hurt us. You know, um, Jesus said, and, and Luke, let me get there real quick so I don't misquote it. That Luke, uh, if I can find it. Ten nineteen. Yeah, there it is. And he says, you know, behold, um, you know, Jesus is talking to the servants that went out, or when he sent the 70 out to the different cities to proclaim, you know, who he was. Um, he says, behold, I give you authority to trample over uh, on serpents and scorpions and over all the powers of the enemy, and nothing but shall any means hurt you. You know, Jesus wasn't messing around or whatever when he said that. He wasn't just saying that to lift their spirits. I mean, that's a true spiritual fact. That we, we, when, we, when we are in Christ, you know, we, we know about the new birth. We know that... You know, when we become saved, we become a new creature. You know, uh, one translation says a, a species never before seen on the earth. We're a totally different person. And so that's what, pe you know, that's what, you know, people should see in us. But if, especially in, you know, the spiritual realm, that's what they see in us. And so there's nothing, you know, that, you know, when we understand that what, what God gave us when Jesus died on the cross, it wasn't just salvation, which is a wonderful, I mean, it could have been just salvation. It would have been great. But he gave us so much more. He gave us life and life more abundantly, you know, to where we can, um, we're more than conquerors in everything that we do. 
It's not just that we get to go to heaven when we die, but we get to live like a king on this earth in a spiritual sense. You know, we don't take advantage of, you know, for me, when I first came into things, you know, when I started talking about financial prosperity and all this stuff, you know, God will make you prosper. It it struck me the wrong way because, you know, I always thought of preachers as just want your money, just want this and want that. But when you understand biblical prosperity, that it's not just to get rich, it's to, you know, further the kingdom, it's to, to provide for your needs and that God wants to do that thing. Then I started realizing, you know, what it was like. And so, um, but, you know, reigning here on this earth is, is not, like it's not taking advantage and getting all the money and everything, but it's really furthering the gospel. But God's given us that power to do so. And so, um, but just like, uh, well, let's, let's go back to the, uh, <laughs> the Atacama Desert I was telling you about earlier. Um, in 2011, um, a really incredible thing happened. Um, a really, really, really big cold front from Antarctica came up, and it was very, very powerful. A huge low pressure system came up, and it was able to break through every barrier that, that, that the desert had to receive rain. And 31 inches of snow fell in the desert that year. And since then, it happened again, I think 2013. But it was pretty incredible because after it all had melted and everything, people noticed that there, were, there was life, you know, there's wildfires growing where they'd never grown before, you know, and it was just an incredible sight to see that this desert that had nothing had life coming out of it. You know, and that's the same thing that happens to us whenever we accept Christ. That's the same thing that happened to uh, Seth whenever he came to the king's table, you know, in a place where he was so, ah, everything was restored to him. I, I, I can only imagine that all that bitterness and all that hatred that Seth had in life was just totally washed away when, when, when David extended his hand out to him and said, don't fear, I'm going to show you kindness. But, you know, and with us, when we come out of that dry place, you know, we, we were lifeless before Christ. There was nothing um, that could grow inside of us spiritually. I mean, we were, you know, when talk, in Galatians it talks about the works of the flesh versus the works of the spirit, the only thing we could produce was the work of the flesh, you know, destruction. That's all we had in us. But when Christ came, just like that cold front, just totally, ah, just, I don't want to say messed up because that's the wrong term, but just totally just changed that, you know, that landscape is the same way that Christ changed us when he came into us. You know, um, now that the love of Christ is in us and that Christ is reborn, uh, we have, you know, the rivers of living water. We'll never, ever have to be dry again. We can always go back to, you know, the throne of grace and, and, and rejuvenate ourselves. We can never, we never have to go back to that place. You can choose to. Um, you know, I mean, there's people who have, but we now just, it's, I don't know, it's just so amazing to me that um, how much, you know, when you're in the world and everything, you don't, you don't understand a lot of things. You, you think you're doing good, you know, you got a pretty good job, you're making money, but there's always something that's missing. And, you know, I felt like that for a long time um, through the Navy and everything. Of, you know, of course, you know, the culture of the Navy is always, you know, drinking and carousing, having a good time and everything. But, you know, even through all that, I just knew that that wasn't, there's something else in life, you know, more than that. And um, there, there were times where, you know, when I was out, you know, I, I really did feel bitter towards God. You know, when my grandmother passed away, I was really upset. You know, she was, she was pretty young when she passed. Um, but, you know, she passed away of, um, what's it called, COPD. And um, I, was, I was really upset, you know, because I was like, she was always the faithful church goer, you know. She was just very, she was a great person. She really was just, just an amazing person. And I thought to myself, how, God, how can you take somebody like that? But you don't realize that it's not God taking them, you know. It's, you know, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, you know. And that's, and that's something I never understood until, I, you know, Christ came into my life. And it's, like I said, it's just so amazing the things that God can show you in such a short period of time. You know, if 
five years ago, if I had, somebody told me today I'd be, you know, ministering the gospel, and I called them crazy. <laughs> I didn't want to have anything to do with religion. I didn't want to have anything to do with God, you know, none of that stuff, because, you know, I didn't want to, <laughs> I didn't want to give up drinking. I didn't want to give up all this other stuff. But, you know, it's, it's incredible how much more fulfilling this life is. Yeah. Even though I'm not maybe financially in a place I used to be, or maybe not living the American dream, if you will, but there's more to it than just that. You know, being able to serve God is just such an amazing thing. And so, you know, I guess everything I'm trying to tell you in this is that, you know, there is <clears throat> a lot that God has to offer you. And that it's, it just depends on whether or not you want to accept it. And a lot of times it's, we, we don't accept it because we don't know about it. <laughs> you know, I didn't, when I got saved, I, you know, people talk about healing, I'm like, what? Like, there's, how can God heal, you know? I mean, uh, God can do anything, but yeah, why would he want to, you know? But, you know, when you're ignorant to things, you obviously don't know anything. But whenever the word comes in, whenever God speaks his word, or whenever you're listening to anointed preachers and pastors teaching you about it, then, you know, you're no longer ignorant about it. It's just a choice of whether or not you want to accept it. And so, you know, I know a lot of times that, God, whenever I was younger, um, I went to a church for about a year on Wednesday nights just because it was the cool thing to do back then. But I just remember the pastor always saying, just read your Bibles and pray. Just read your Bibles and pray, you know. But, and that's, that's true in effect, you know. We have, to read, you know, we have to read the Word. Faith comes by hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing of the Word, as Brother Hagin would say. But, you know, we also had to have a relationship, you know, prayer-wise with God. But... We also have to put our faith into action. You know, there's no, you can't just sit around and expect it to happen. You have to go out and, and, and do it, whether that means speaking the word in your circumstance. If you're, you know, if you need healing, then you got to get into the word and find out what God says about healing. You know, we know that he wants to heal us. But then you have to renew your mind to it, you know. Confessing scriptures all the time. It's not the confessing of scriptures that's going to get you healed, but it's the faith that it builds up in you where you get to that point where it becomes so real to you that you have the faith to activate what God's wanting to do. Same thing with finances, you know, that's, a, <clears throat> that's always a tough one because, you know, whether we want to admit it or not, we do need money. You know, we, we live in a world that's governed by the dollar or the yen or the euro or whatever you want to call it, but, you know, you know how can God, who's invisible and somewhere off in the distance, how can he bring me money? Well, there's, there's several ways he can do it. I mean, look at, uh, I think it was Elijah. Yeah, Elijah, when, when God told him to go out to the desert, and the, you know, the ravens were bringing him bread, you know, bringing him provision. I mean, if God has to do that for you, he'll do it. But if we don't know about it, then how can we take that? And so, you know, the, the amazing thing about, I, I love about, uh, I'm so glad that when I did get saved um, that I came into a Rhema church um, because there's so many things that you just, you can miss out on, really. And, you know, there's, I had a lot of questions when I came in, let's just put it that way, because I didn't think that, you know, like, you're, you're telling me I can have all this, but I don't, I don't know if I can handle that, you know. But then, you know, you have you know, pastors and, and um, you know, speakers come in who have been trained, you know, at Rama, who know the word and then live the word, that they are able, you know, through the anointing to just show you it. And then that's, you know, what I love about being able to come here is that, you know, I left a really good church in Oklahoma um, before I went to Rama, and I loved it. I could have stayed there forever. I loved my pastors, you know, they're, they're great, amazing people. But I was so blessed when I came here, and I basically got the same pastors, just in a different form. You know, just uncompromising truth, uncompromising word. And um, I'm going to tell you that um, as I was you know, studying for this lesson, too, this really doesn't have anything to do with Seth, but <laughs> as I was studying for it, you know, I read pretty much all of 1 Samuel up to where I was reading just to get the context of what was going on. 
But the amazing thing to me about David was um, whenever, you know, Saul had been killed, Jonathan, all the, you know, all the sons, you know, they were all killed. But David still had so much respect for Saul whenever he passed away, uh, whenever he was killed. Uh, let me see if I can find it. And, you know, having that respect for the anointing and for the people above you goes such a long way. I, I, I firmly believe that had David not, um, you know, respected Saul in the way he did, he would not have been as successful as he was. Um, because you got to understand, you know, David was anointed king before Saul even died, way before Saul even died. And he served under Saul. Saul tried to kill him numerous times. You know, he chased him around the desert for how many years, you know? And, and there was an opportunity that David had to kill Saul. I mean, they were in a cave and Saul was doing his business and David cut off a piece of his clothing instead of killing him and showed it to him and said, I could have killed you, but he didn't. He had such respect for those people, for God's, you know, anointing on Saul's life. He had respect for that. And back in 2 Samuel, um, if you read chapter 1, you know, he... He, he sang a song for Saul, talking about how amazing he was, how, how, how you know, courageous he was, and just how much of a good person he was, when we know that Saul wasn't necessarily a great person. But he still had the respect for the, the anointing. He had the respect for the position. And that will get you very far in your Christian walk if you have respect for those people who are over you. Um, you know, like with Pastor, he has the pastoral anointing. It's not something to take lightly, you know. It's somebody who can speak into your life. And it's somebody, when you call him pastor and you respect him as pastor, that he can walk in that anointing and he can, he can speak one word by the Spirit that can change your entire life, that can change every situation that you're in. But if you don't respect that, you can't receive from it. That's why you, gotta keep, you, know, you always got to keep your heart open in these sort of things because if you don't, you're going to miss what God's trying to do for you. And um, it's just, like I said, it's amazing to me um, just the amount of respect and the amount of honor, I guess, that David had for Saul. And um, like I said, regardless of <laughs> him trying to take his life or chase him around the desert, he stayed true to him until the very end. And he didn't try to exalt himself to a place that he wasn't necessarily ready for yet because, you know, had David killed Saul at that point, and he became king, would he, have already had, would, he, would he have had the tools that he needed to be successful? Or was there something else that he had to learn along the way before you know, we got there? Um, but yeah, that's it it something that's been on my heart a lot lately as far as, um, as that goes, is, is just re really respecting you know, the, things that, the people that God puts in your life because it's, it's, they're not there by accident. You know, if you're called to this church, then you're called to be under pastor, and you're called to be under his anointing, which means that he has certain responsibilities to you, which he takes very seriously, but also that you have responsibilities to him. You know, you, you, you have to, whether, you have to support him, I mean, in and, and prayer and, and everything that you do. Um, so, I don't know where I went that way, but <laughs> um, that's, this is something that's been on my heart, and I just wanted to share it with you guys. Um, so, yeah. Um, the title of this message actually was um, From Dry Places to the King's Embraces. Because, um, you know, we saw how he came from that really dry place, and, and, and Seth became, you know, a, a king, a, a really a son of a king. I mean, he wasn't by birth the son of of, of um, David but he still got to reap all the benefits of being the son which is the same that we get when we're in Christ you know we get all the benefits of being in Christ because God made it happen and um, so I just want to leave you with that today and uh, this is time to take up the offering um, we don't have the square card available tonight um pastors out of town and we don't have we trust that you were blessed by the word of god and the flow of the spirit of god in this service if you would like to contact us please write us via email at 
office at fbc.org or using our mailing address, P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.